good. Can you hear me? Great. I think it's time to start. Good evening, everyone. What a great crowd. Hi, my name is Barbara Altman. I'm director of the Oregon Humanities Center, and I'd like to welcome you to the Center's 2009-2010 Colin Rowe Thomas O'Fallon Lecture in Art and American Culture. The O'Fallon Lecture was established by a generous gift from Henry and Betsy Mayer, named in honor of their nephew Colin, and in his memory, Colin, son of University of Oregon professor, in law, Jim O'Fallon, and his wife, artist Ellen Thomas. And I say a special welcome to the whole O'Fallon family here today. It's always a pleasure to see you. And thank you for allowing us to do this. The topic of the lecture on this particular occasion um, is art, although the lectureship alternates between a focus on American jurisprudence and art. Our presence in Lawrence Hall would be a tip-off that this year we're talking about art. We are very pleased to host book artist, designer, and lettering artist Suzanne Moore. Moore has a long involvement in book arts, to which she brings expertise and tools from work as diverse as historic building restoration, exhibition designer, and art director of a lettering and font design group, which I discovered over dinner was indeed for a greeting card company, so she brings many talents to this. Sought out for the inimitable style of her art, Moore is one of only three Americans working with a team of scribes and illuminators in the process, since 2001, of producing the exquisite St. John's Bible, a project directed from Wales by Donald Jackson. I was particularly excited about bringing Moore not only because she is a highly esteemed book artist whose creations appear in private and institutional collections through North America and Europe, but also because she anchors her artistic production in a deep understanding of the medieval roots of manuscript art. As she explained to me today, using medieval practices reveals that those practices were founded on principles of good design, and thus, perhaps unexpectedly, we understand medieval manuscript art as a form better in retrospect by using these techniques many hundreds of years old. We have an audience tonight drawn from the community and from two campuses, a special welcome and thank you to our friends and colleagues from Lane Community College, um, with whom Suzanne spoke this afternoon, and to students from both LCC and from U of O. My entire medieval literature class is here en masse. It's nice to see you outside the classroom. And if you need copies of the questions, they're in the right-hand corner there. I would also like to express my great appreciation to the staff of the Oregon Humanities Center, without whom these things simply don't happen. So my thanks for organizing Suzanne's, Suzanne Moore's visit to Associate Director Julia Hayden, who tracked down Suzanne in the first place, to events coordinator Melissa Gust Gustafson, who did all the logistics, to our communications person and designer Peg Gearhart, who, who did all the beautiful work for publicity, and um, our front office woman Lindsay Henriksen, who's here tonight helping, and our, our uh, intrepid guy Ty, who postered all over campus. It's a lot of work to bring a guest of this um, distinction, and it takes a whole team. So thank you to everyone who helped. Suzanne Moore was good enough to do a 30-minute interview with me this afternoon for our TV show, UO Today. And you might want to watch that episode when it airs in three or four weeks from now, or you can find it on the UO channel at your convenience. I should also mention that Moore's O'Fallon Lecture is part of our Humanity Center's Year of the Book programming. We've had a lot of good things happen already and there's a lot more to come. So I invite you to look at our website where all the, the events are listed in detail. Before handing over the podium, I want to set the scene for Suzanne Moore's talk by recounting an, an anecdote. An encounter with Suzanne Moore's work is not a neutral experience. I think this story will explain that. I'm going to read a short paragraph by Sandra Krupa, Special Collections Librarian at the University of Washington in Seattle, that describes her reaction upon reading Proud Ephemerals, one of four volumes Moore did using excerpts from Emerson's early essays. Krupa says, and I quote, when I read the text of Proud Ephemerals in Moore's carefully shaped lettering, embellished with color and gold, I felt as if she had taken a forest found the one tree to symbolize the whole and reformed it. She placed it with reverence in my hands and I could feel each word in my bones. Then and there, I said she couldn't send it to the dealer back east who was expecting it. This one had to stay here. 
Her books create an environment for the text to be discovered anew. Opening the book, I experience a tenderness for the words, a peace, an understanding, an acknowledgement, a unity with the words. Each word is chosen, crafted, enhanced, blessed, and sent out to touch the reader. I have acquired few pieces in my career that thrilled me so much. And that's the end of that passage. With that as a preamble, please join me in welcoming Suzanne Moore. Good evening. I, too, want to extend thanks to the O'Fallon family, who I got to meet at dinner tonight, and also to everyone at the Oregon Humanities Center. Um, I, I, too, am very appreciative of what it has taken um, for someone else to, to get me here and get all the, all the orchestration done that um, makes this evening possible. And, and I appreciate you all coming um, this evening. It's, it's great to see a full house. Is this loud enough? Are we set? Okay, good. Um, I live as a maker of books full time, and I live with another maker of books, another book artist, my husband Don Glaster. So every year at our house is pretty much a year of the book. <laughs> um, but it's it's nice to be reminded that there really is something to celebrate about um, what books give us, what um, is transferred from one human to another through some form of a book, whether it be a medieval work or something, oh, so contemporary and tiny that slips in our pocket and turns on with, with uh, some ether uh, transferring information. So um, I, I uh, am grateful to kind of re-examine what I do when I go to prepare a talk like this. Um, I, I put together some things that might surprise you a little bit. We never know uh, what to expect when we uh, go to a lecture, but um, I define book and manuscript book probably a lot more broadly than um, the, the true dictionary definition. And you'll see that um, my tastes through these selections are very eclectic. I really consider um, books to be something that can be even uh, shown in architectural settings, and they're things that are kind of experiential. They deliver information, and, um, and by the same token, they can, be, they can be held in your hand. Letter forms are part of our lives historically to do all kinds of things, to record, to transfer information, to inspire comfort, and cure. Um, healing texts early on were key next to sacred texts to keep people healthy. And, um, and allegorical books, too, were things that taught us lessons about how to, how to live life. So there's so many purposes 
four books historically. And um, because we don't have the same necessity of producing books to suit the needs of a, a particular client or um, as the sole means of transferring information, as contemporary book workers, we have both the depth of information and the history of the book to at our service, and we also have everything from the contemporary world um, around us to inspire and inform our work. My goal is to use historic information and references uh, from all time periods and many cultures as a way to um, see kind of an ancestry of the book. And a lot of the practices, as um, uh, Barbara mentioned, are actually based on what medieval scribes would have done. And they make a lot of sense. It's, it's uh, not so much the aesthetics of it, but it's the um, production part of actually accomplishing and finishing a book. So manuscript is from manuscriptus, and it defines a book that is written by hand, especially before the invention of the printing press. That the manuscript book tradition provides the foundation upon which much of the finest contemporary manuscript book design and other printed book design actually rests. And you'll see in the lecture that, that there's a very a simple diagram based on the golden mean proportions, uh, which has, has been universal in time and place as far as um, a standard for the design of a book page. In addition to manuscript books, I'm including books and pieces of work that are written or created in a way that leaves the trace of the hand on the page on clay or on metal. So they're still written forms um, and although in some of the examples they'll look much more like type than what you think of as calligraphy, there, there's an unmistakable trace left of, of the hand of the maker. So my definition of manuscript is actually broader in aesthetics than you might imagine. The images I've selected to show will show you some of the connections and some of the dramatic contrasts between historic and contemporary lettering and books written by hand. Manuscript books are the vehicle through which some of the finest paintings have been preserved and protected over time. The, the physical structure of the book is a, is a perfect protective device for vellum pages and, um, and pages that were made on paper and other cultures, uh, paper and papyrus. The role of the scribe traditionally was one in which the, the person who had that position was often very close to some kind of power. Um, from the earliest times, the scribes were recorders of economic situations, so they were record keepers. In politics, they were writers of decrees, laws, and proclamations. And in religious and spiritual communities, they were the scribes of sacred texts. So quite often, even if they, uh, their position didn't um, come with power, they were very close to um, the, the seat of power in a society. In some cultures, writing ends up as part of space and architecture, and um, the carving and impression in various materials that, that we see in other cultures is quite an amazing way to experience written forms and carved forms. This one is the Temple of Amun-Re, and um, I, I really love this image because it, it, you see kind of the ruins in the distance, but close up you have this, this tactile opportunity with um, a wall of a piece of architecture. 
This piece is a rubbing uh, done from an ancient Chinese metal inscription. So um, the difference between writing a text and uh, casting it or carving it in metal is quite extraordinary. And in order to be able to make copies, then the, um, the text would be rubbed and distributed on paper. And you can see that the way that these letter forms look are distinct to the technique in which they were made. Different tools, different end product, and this is another example. This is a clay cuneiform tablet, quite a large one. And these indentations in wet clay are made with a little um, uh, slightly triangular stylus. And so rather than writing, the, the person would actually make the letter forms by making a series of impressions in this wet clay. And this is an interesting piece I had never come across um, a cuneiform that had an extensive biblical story in it. But this one happens to be um, the, uh, an account of Noah's flood. And I, I thought it was fascinating that um, at that, at that um, it, time period, it would have been um, a, a biblical story. So we're doing a little round the world tour here. <laughs> And um, this piece is, is Arabic, and um, it's a, a lovely example of a pure page of lettering written with a reed on skin and incredibly powerful graphic forms. Um, as with any letter form, there are many different aesthetic approaches to conveying that uh, information by writing and typography. And so this is a, it's a quite distinct um, kind of composition and density of, of these forms. The, um, and, and this, of course, comes from a culture and a tradition where uh, lettering is to, and especially of spiritual texts of the Quran, is meant to be unadorned by pictures. So. Um, in, in this tradition, the letter forms are the only aesthetic um, element of the piece. This piece has always delighted me. I, I got a, a slide made of it when I was in college and before I had even started studying art. There was something about it that just um, was so delightful to me. And um, it, it is in some ways more closely, closely related in concept to my goals as a lettering artist than, than just about any other early piece. And by that I mean I really see letter forms as a subject of painting and drawing and printmaking. So in addition to being a, a person who letters out texts in a contemporary version of quite traditional forms, um, I really see letter forms as um, a, a subject, much like a, a painter would have another subject as, as a favorite um, uh, thing to paint or draw or, or make art about. So rather than landscape or portrait or still life, I just happen to paint about letters. And um, there's a wonderful passage um, it, that people use in the lettering world and, and it says, um, letters are things, not pictures of things. And we sometimes just think they're, you know, they're a, a sign system. But I really do kind of see them as um, uh, subject. So this is, a, this is a delightful piece that tells you about um, the time period. It's done on vellum and you can see the little uh, tiny traces even in this blown up image of the hair follicles of the vellum. So, um, and it would be a painted piece with the little tiny letter forms that, that give you the key to what that letter is in case you can't see it, um, written probably with a quill and, um, and the other uh, parts of, of the built up imagery would be painted.
And then we move to another time period, 1695, and this is a piece by John Seden and in Penman's Paradise. And um, he, the, the title of that piece is Penman's Paradise, Both Pleasant and Profitable. And you can see that it's, it's incredibly distinct, still some of the same letters that we saw in the last slide, but um, it's distinct to its time period, the way that the um, tool works in the hand of the scribe and uh, makes those very stylized thicks and thins on the paper is so distinct to the time and the place that it was made. This um, early piece is from Lambert's Liber Floridas, um, done at the Abbey of St. Owen about 1120 very early and it's rare because at this time period the uh, number of sacred texts that would have been produced would have far outnumbered texts like this which is a scientific piece and it gives us a glimpse of the curiosity about scientific information during this um, time of the Middle Ages and I love it because it's such a wonderful integration of lettering and imagery. So you have things that are pure letter forms, you have things that are uh, primarily imagery, and, and in some cultures, I'll show you later, um, the pieces are, the stories are told with images only. I still consider them a manuscript because they're they're always done by hand. They're, they're done in, a, in the same kind of tradition that a manuscript would be done. But, um, and they're, they're usually called manuscripts because they're not printed pieces. Um, but this one is a wonderful, very early integration of lettering and design. Powerful, central design. But if you imagine it without the, the texture of lettering that continues to kind of build on that design, it would be a very different piece. And of course, any written form really connects us in a, in a very different way than most paintings do, I think, to the hand that made it. You really see the, either the strength or the weakness of, of how that hand works across the page and how the ink goes down and, and uh, all of those things. This is a much more contemporary piece. It's the turn of the, the uh, sorry, it, it's in the last century, not at the turn of the century. But Irene Wellington uh, was a person who lived in England and was a student of really the father of contemporary calligraphy, Edward Johnston. And I consider her part of my lineage because she is a person that taught um, Donald Jackson when he was in art school. And Donald Jackson was a teacher of my, uh, uh, a teacher that had a big impact on me, Thomas Ingmeyer. And um, Donald and Thomas and I are all uh, part of the team with Donald at the head, working on the St. John's Bible. So there really is quite a connection to um, someone like, like Irene all over the lettering world. And she has this same marvelous, uh, integration of the lettering and the imagery. This piece is on vellum, so the way the paint goes onto the vellum is quite lovely, even in a slide like this. But if you ever get a chance to see work like this, that um, it, you have access to see the real piece. It's quite extraordinary what vellum does when you write and letter on it. The, the way that vellum works is that it's, it's a skin that's been treated in a particular way. It's sanded with various grits of a sanding sandpaper. And it's sanded down to a finish that is very much like the, the finest, finest, finest velvet you could imagine. So almost like the peach fuzz on your skin. And of course, it's skin from an animal. So it has a, you know, it's, it still has a life, I mean, it's alive um, in another form, but, but it has a very different feel. 
than any kind of paper that's even made to imitate it. So when you write, so you imagine this very fine peach fuzz, and the quill is a, a, a perfect tool because it's so light, and you can trim it to be exactly the way you want it to be in your hand and the way you want it to work. And you dip the quill into ink. And when you put it down and write on the vellum, what it's doing is it's delivering that little line of fluid and making a little channel in the velvet. So you know how the velvet paintings that you see and the, you know, the black velvet things? And, and that velvet has the paint sitting on the surface. Well, this does just the opposite. It, the quill actually pulls that little channel, and the ink lays down in it. And the, the fine, fine peach fuzz on the surface of the vellum makes the edges incredibly crisp and beautiful. Paper works in a very different way, where there's the surface of the paper, and the ink goes down, and it goes in a little dome-shaped um, design on the page. And so the edges never are going to be, have the same crispness that you'll see on vellum. It's a little harder to paint on because of that dryness and that nappy quality of it. Um, when um, Thomas Ingmeyer and I were first working on this, I got a call from him and he said, so how the hell do you work on this stuff? <laughs> <You know? laughs> because we'd both worked on vellum, but we really were encountering some things with techniques we wanted to use that, that um, were difficult because it's made to write on. It's not really made to paint on. What we finally discovered was that if when they're treating the vellum before they send the leaves to us, if they, if they know the piece of the part of the vellum that's going to have the painting on it, they don't sand it in the same way. They leave it and then we burnish it back down. So we burnish down that, that nappy stuff so that the brush can work in a very different way than the quill does. So this piece of, of Irene's has a lot to um, do with the previous piece where the integration of lettering and imagery is, is quite lovely. And um, if you took away, say, that top line of the very finest lettering, you'd have a very different piece um, and, you know, I, when I look at a piece and I, there's something about it that really is magic to me, I, I try to figure out, is there anything about this that you could take away that, that you could get away with it, you know, that the piece would still survive? And I, I think it's such a lovely example of both technique and that, that uh, perfect integration of image and, and lettering. And then we move to another culture. This piece is, is um, a Chinese piece from the 19th century. And it's just part of a piece that is uh, in a, a part of a hanging scroll called The Fragrance of Antiquity. And again, it's clearly a written form, incredibly bold, could hardly be more different than um, Irene's piece, even though they're only about 100 years apart. And um, in, in the Chinese culture, as in our culture, lots of different kinds of letter forms. But um, this bold piece, when I was collecting kind of connections between different time periods and places, I was so struck by it because um, I had also pulled out some images from a book by Pablo Picasso. And this piece is one of the only images in the Picasso book that is um, pure image without written forms, but still has that idea of the hand of the maker. This is a title page, and it's Le Chant des Morts. And um, it's an artist's book that Picasso produced. And although it's not fine writing, it's uh, the whole book is done in very loose handwriting. And the borders, as in early manuscripts, you'll, you'll see um, a little bit later, but, but we've all, you know, have an image in our mind of what a, what a illuminated manuscript looks like. And quite often it has a border and it has a place for the text and those two interact with each other. So um, I remembered some of what this book was like. This was a book that my husband got to bind. And um, because he, 
has, has been binding for so long and, and he gets a, a wonderful array of books to work on. Um, we have had some pretty extraordinary books in our house to be able to look at, books that we wouldn't normally get to see otherwise. So um, I had no idea that um, Picasso did books where his handwriting would have been part of the aesthetic of the book. But you kind of set up that same idea of the border and the place that the lettering lives. And we move to a, another connection between an early work and uh, someone that you might not think of doing pen work. But um, this is a piece by Richard Carter in 1695, and you know, wonderful pen play, and it's part of an arithmetic book. So it was a decoration that was actually done in what was designed as an arithmetic book. And this is something that I found in New York and gave to my husband for Christmas. It's, it's quite large. It's a book about this big, and it's a reproduction done in 1961 of um, a, a coloring book that Andy Worrell designed. And, you know, we think of soup cans and Marilyn and Mao and all those things, but the early work that Andy Worrell did had so much work in it that was done, especially things that he did for uh, the commercial uh, industry in New York before he did uh, kind of wall art. He did a tremendous amount of advertising art for department stores in Manhattan, and a great deal of it was done with um, pen forms like this. And there's no other tool that would deliver the kind of writing and drawing and um, weights of pens that uh, he did other than that kind of a tool. And even though these have a very mechanical feeling, I hope you can still see a little bit of the fact that, that they were drawn by hand. This is um, a Bauhaus alphabet designed by Joseph Albers and done on grid paper. And it's called a combinatory alphabet. So elements that were common throughout the alphabet could be moved around to make a series of shapes that would read as an alphabet. Um, Without uh, the human element of this and the idea uh, behind the design, you would, you would never come up with this based on purely historic um, examples. But it's such an interesting example of how um, the, the aesthetics of a particular time drove a designer to create something that was absolutely of his time. And you know, if you, if you enjoy that time period at all or hate that time period <laughs> um, in architecture, you have a feel that um, this alphabet might fit with it a lot better than you know, pen work or brush work or something like that. And this piece, unbelievably, is also written by hand. When I saw this image, I really wondered if it wasn't an engraving, because quite often a penman would do work and then hand it to an engraver, and the engraving would produce the regularity that you see in this piece. But indeed, it is a very, very stylized um, written piece. So this whole idea of um, how letters are formed, I think, is key to how contemporary manuscripts get made because as I said, you know, we have the scribal, the early scribal traditions, but hopefully we're shooting for a manuscript that really is a 21st century piece and um, has some things about it that are particular to our time and our knowledge and our interests in our surroundings. This piece is um, more recent than um, the previous one, which, which I, I mentioned was written by hand. And this looks very typographic. The first time I saw it kind of from a few feet away, I asked what font it was. 
And, you know, everybody that was closer to it kind of looked at me and rolled their eyes like, you idiot. You know, she drew the letters. <laughs> and so these letters were all drawn by hand for the whole book by um, our friend Susan Skarsgård, who currently is a, is, a, is a designer for GM in Detroit. But she has a history doing things, of doing things like this very precise and, and as well as doing things that are very free and very painterly. But I think this is such a marvelous um, way of thinking about um, lettering design and, and bookmaking. And hopefully in this image you can see little tiny traces of the kind of inconsistencies that you wouldn't see in type. But it, she's taken that, that regularity of um, a, a typographic form and infuse this hand-done piece with that. To extend the idea that it's a 20, 20th century piece, um, it's, this is a little book that was done in a, an edition called Blue Boy, and um, the author is Jean Giano, and they did this book in 1989. She reproduced it on a, she was real interested in what you could get a copier to do, to, to make a really nice book. And so she took a lovely French paper called Arches Text Wove, which has a, a lovely feel to it, and um, really worked hard to get a copier to reproduce these letter forms that she had so carefully made so that she could do the whole edition um, on the copier. So using a very 21st century idea to make something that in some ways is very reflective of more traditional books with word and image integrating to make a succession of pages. And you'll see that little trace on the left-hand side, also called the verso of a page spread in codex books. You'll see a little trace of what's happening on the previous page, and that's called show through. And I saw that um, so such a stunning representation of that um, when I saw the first really, really fine manuscript book written on vellum that I ever got to see. Not all vellum, you know, is the same. A lot of it is, you know, the early pieces that were done and we see single sheets of. The, the vellum is very thick because the book was, was very big. But the first early manuscript that I saw that had very fine vellum. You could actually see five layers of painting and lettering. You could see the surface of the page, the back of the page, the surface of the next page, the back of the next page, and the, the show through of the page behind it in you know, just little places where there were gaps in the image. And um, that whole idea of the page being opaque really to where you, you write and, and letter on it, but having the feeling of the dimension of the book, because that's the big difference between a book and a two-dimensional piece, is that you have this, this progression of openings that give the reader an experience that, that a story or a message evolves as you take the trip through the book. So that, on this Arches paper, uh, has a lovely show through with with intense color and with black. So you get that dimension and you're seeing it just on the right side, just above um, that first line of text. And Mike, you showed me the pointer, but then I don't think I picked it up from you. Is that louder? Oh, here it is. Great. I love these magic devices. We were in um, New Mexico a couple years ago, and there was a class on the night skies, and there was a guy there that had a laser pointer that it looked like you were touching the star. It was so strong. I was so impressed. I want one of those. <laughs> there we go. So that show through right there you're seeing, and this right here is the longer line that's on the next page that you're seeing through. So you, you build up this kind of depth, even though what you're really looking at is, is the page that you're seeing. So that's a close-up of lettering 
drawn by hand. And um, the book is only about 10 inches tall, so that gives you an idea that this lettering is less than a quarter of an inch high. And even when it's blown up like this, it's, it's quite extraordinary. But, but look at the little bit of, of wavery, a waving kind of top of the line. See that kind of little wave and the N is a little bit shorter. And you know, you have this little subtle undulation that makes it more lively than uh, pure type. And the, the real gift for lettering artists is that I can make anything fit into a particular place. Um, I can change the and uh, compress and expand the letter forms and really get things to, to fit in ways that you'd be hard pressed, especially without a computer. <laughs> you can do a lot more of it now, but um, with hard type, you'd really uh, have a difficult time doing that. And then a couple of things from a very different culture that are also, um, in a way, a kind of manuscript, things that you might not you know, normally put in that category. But um, this is a, an Inca poncho that has woven inscriptions. So it's not just pattern. It, it actually contains inscriptions from that particular um, culture. And it has an interesting um, uh, way of breaking up the space that has everything to do with other kinds of uh, pieces from similar places and times. And this is a um, codex, it's from the Codex Borbonicus, and this particular one is the Totec God of Spring. It's pre-16th century, and it happens to be one of 38 leaves that make up an elaborate astro astrological calendar um, the, um, in this culture, the, the cycles of the universe were a, a big part of life, and so you see this almost comic strip-like combination of image and lettering that um, makes up this, this wonderful pattern. And in some ways, it's a little bit um, sets up that border idea and, and the juxtaposition of the large image and the smaller one. But again, you have these combinations of image and lettering that if you took one of those elements away, it would change the piece dramatically. This is a much later grid-like uh, design. It's Ethiopian, and um, there's some extraordinary early Ethiopian uh, things that, that I've admired for a long time. But this is, is also a biblical account, and it's the meeting of Solomon and Sheba. It was done in 1980, um, oil on canvas, and this idea of the panel divided in a grid, um, I chose, I kind of discovered in the process. because this idea, this is a piece from the St. John's Bible in um, the Wisdom of Solomon that Donald Jackson did, and it has that same kind of idea of the, the blocks kind of unfolding the various facets of a message and that kind of comic strip look. This one obviously combined with a more traditional page design the St. John's Bible is set up in two columns for all of the page spreads on each page, so they all um, are, are configured in this way. Um, and then if you look at the detail in the third panel of this, and um, it doesn't cover a lot of space, but think of how powerful these parts of the design are and how this one these, these areas spilling out from this very uh, kind of encapsulated set of images make such a big difference. And then in the center, this doesn't show up looking like gold, but these little kind of lozenges of gold actually really connect these, this set of four pieces across the spine of the book. And this is by um, a friend of mine came to visit recently, and she had this uh, a couple of sketchbooks with her. Her name is Lori Doctor, and she's a lettering artist who lives in uh, now in Kentucky. She lived in Denver for uh, in Boulder for a long time, 
And this whole idea of the grid, I realized, because I had, I had taken some images of her work just because I was interested in it, but I realized that it was apparent in a lot of her work. And so she does these things very loosely, really to just, you know, as, as most of us would do journals of different kinds. Sometimes it's really just recording information and, and then experimenting with imagery. But again, that kind of integration of the um, lettering. And if you took those little, that little texture of lettering out of it, what would happen? And, and then we're going to move to the page design that has been constant in the history of the Codex book for a long period of time. You, you just saw that image of the St. John's Bible and you can kind of imagine that there was an architecture to those, uh, the design of those pages. And indeed, it really is based on the principles of the golden mean, the golden section, where certain proportions in the Western culture are pleasing to our anatomy, to our kind of unspoken and, and subconscious aesthetic. And it was discovered in um, the 20th century. There was a lot of research done on it um, through kind of cross-culturally. And they discovered that, that it's not just um, apparent in Western manuscripts, but that it also works very well in Eastern manuscripts. So the idea is you, you uh, decide on the page, which in the most strict way of applying it, the proportion of the width of the page to the height of the page also has to be based on uh, classic proportions. I use that a little more loosely, and sometimes very loosely, and um, you'll see uh, in contrast to the previous page that I showed you of Lori's where the paint and the imagery goes all the way out to the edge, sometimes even in a very horizontal format. So it's really meant to be used in a vertical format, but it also can be used in a, in a little different way with some changes in, in proportions um, in a horizontal format. But traditionally it's used like this and you draw lines from uh, the two corners as precisely, this is a time for real precision because you're basing the whole book design on it. And, and then you draw a line from the top center fold to each of the outside lower corners. And, and then somewhere on this line, you choose a point. It can be here, it can be much closer in. And you choose a point and from that point, you drop down a vertical. You then make a parallel line that has to drop from somewhere on this point. And in order to find that, you've done a perpendicular. So the spine of the book and the fold, if you're working on a deckled paper, but particularly if you're working on vellum, which has some undulation in it, the, the spine fold is the only absolute constant in the book. The edges might ruffle, they might have deckles. Um, so you can count on that to be the, the clean line from which you can make these parallels, you can make perpendiculars and, and extend the parallels. And you'll see this corner down here doesn't end up on one of these lines at all. So you really are working from this point and pulling a horizontal out to here dropping that vertical down. And, and as I said, I could choose a point down here, and I, my margins would be a lot bigger, and then I would pull it over to here and drop it down. Okay? So that's the idea. And even on a horizontal book, you can see that um, Lori has applied this. So what you have in this previous image is the space in the middle is equal to this space. So the combined space here and here are equal to this. Quite often, we think of a page design as this being a panel and you center something, and this being a panel and you center something. But if you do that, it looks like it's flying out, out from the center. So um, this one really settles the imagery into the page spread 
And you can see it has big borders, the biggest border on the bottom. Usually um, this one is the next largest and quite often this one is the smallest. And this is the page design that I'll show you later for a, a book that I just completed of 10 Bob Dylan song lyrics. So um, very contemporary book, but in many ways, but it still rests on this historic tradition. So even in this horizontal format, Lori has used that principle, and you can see that the way she's placed these is much closer together, closer to the center of the spine. No matter what happens inside that, here the grid and here the two columns of, of places that she's drawn and painted, um, you still have that kind of um, place in which the image rests very comfortably on the page. Her grid appeared again. And the looseness of these forms, I think, is really um, interesting to see. She, she's made up, as a lot of lettering people and artists have done, kind of made up languages that um, are known to her, but maybe not the rest of us. And, and so although the page has changed here, it takes up, the image takes up a little more space, left and right, we, we also see this kind of recurring thing of the, of the uh, broken up space and um, treated very loosely compared, say, to the Inca designs. And then sometimes, you know, you have in, in the same book, you have uh, a place where you really break the rules, where you just completely ignore the rule that you've made to, to around which to design all the pages. In the manuscript book tradition, um, the codex book is made up of gatherings, uh, or choirs they're called, and that's the term for the pages that go inside of each other. They, here you can see the um, effect of that traditional page design, a little bit, um, even though we don't have a facing page to look at it, you, kinda, you can kind of imagine that, that the facing page is gonna be a, approximately a mirror image and that there's a lot more space on the bottom um, space here that will equal this combined space and that um, that that kind of uh, setting of the text and image on the page has a really wonderful pattern to it as you look through all these different pages. So the individual folded sheets are called folios and the gathering or choir of a number of folios all gathered together to stack them up and get them ready to bind. These are called gatherings. And our golden mean um, design plays out in manuscripts of all sizes, tiny little miniature personal volumes and bigger volumes. And the one thing I didn't mention earlier is, interestingly enough, this is the optical center of each page. So the place that those two lines cross are the optical center. And I realized on a recent page for the Bible um, that the image, the place that they had left for me to put an image was way down here. And anytime you get a long distance from the optical center, the farther away you get, the more unbalanced the page looks. And this was an illustration of Ruth, which it's, it's not been published yet, so I couldn't actually show it to you. But what I discovered was that Ruth, was way down here, and if I turned her head, which was about here, to gaze at this point, all of a sudden, all the power of the page got balanced out. So I couldn't change where Ruth was going to live, but I could change the way the attention on that page would affect the reader. And I kind of knew this principle from book design, because Eric Gill had used it in the four Gospels, but I'd never used it in that way. So um, this is a really powerful diagram and design principle. At the very end of the talk, I have some images that um, show you the book that I actually designed this for, but this was one of the, one of the best um, illustrations that I could use about how that grid is then used. So, Underneath the tracing paper on the right, you can see the traces of that design. And 
This is when I'm working on a text, what I do is I enlarge the typographic form to, to reflect the size of the hand lettering. So I've done a writing sample. I just enlarge it on a Xerox machine um, to replicate the length of each line. And then I can just cut and paste these. So rather than making a hand lettered um, model of each page, I can use um, mechanical means, which unfortunately the scribes didn't have access to. And um, I can figure out the line lengths and the basic page design. And you can see that I've determined the left-hand margin is um, all the lines are going to be justified left, pushed over to the left. And there's a lot of space over here that's not being used. It's not that you have to fill up the entire space with the same thing. It's just that if you have this underlying structure in the page design, as you go through the book, the reader has this feeling of pattern that subconsciously, you know, kind of uh, creates a rhythm through the book. And in pages like this, you can see the, the margins have been cut off a little bit, unfortunately. But you can see that the center margin is a little bit smaller. And you can see the pages of this book have actually been trimmed. But we can assume that it had much more of that um, idea of that page design when it was untrimmed and when it was first made. This also is just one of my favorite really early images. I, I don't know anything about it because I just, someone just gave me a slide of it. But um, it, it has this powerful set of eyes that are looking out to you. And, and I'm assuming it's a, a medical text of some kind. So um, someday I may find a, a, the, the history of this image. And then here we see the much more, the thing that we really think of as, as a traditional illuminated book. And you can see on this page that the margins are, are pretty much disappearing as it goes into the spine. There's a little trace of unpainted uh, paper in there. But you can imagine that um, slightly altered for the scale and proportion of the book, you can imagine that this is one uh, place on those lines. And then this one lives within it to separate the lettering from this highly, highly stylized and decorated acanthus border. And then inside that area, the um, images, these miniatures, move around. So they don't always stay in exactly the same place. But um, this has so much to do with our tradition as far as um, page design. And if you start to look at, at uh, early things, you'll see it over and over again, played out in, in so many interesting ways. So the historic, historic tradition of manuscript bookmaking was not uh, a necessity after the invent invention of movable type with Gutenberg. And it wasn't until um, the mid-90s that Donald Jackson, who you see here, um, had the idea and started talking to the people at St. John's University about creating a fully handwritten Bible, uh, really with the idea of taking some of these historic traditions um, and bringing them fast forward into the 20th and 21st century and really producing a complete Bible written on vellum and illuminated for St. John's Abbey in Collegeville, Minnesota. Um, for anyone that's made very many books, and he asked me what I thought of the idea early on, I said, you know, every book I've ever made changes me in ways by what I learn from working so closely with a text and working on it in the very concentrated way you have to. I said, every book changes me. The scale of this, this project was so big that I said, you won't even guess the changes that, that will be made in your work and your way of thinking and your relationships by working on a project like this. And um, I, you know that, that was just my best guess for what would happen. And it, it did turn out to be quite an extraordinary project. So he was at his drawing board working on that um, piece, which is the opening of the Gospel of Matthew. 
And this piece is quite wonderful. It's the uh, genealogy of Christ. And it's, interestingly enough, it's because it was in, in the tradition of Abraham, it's, it's made in the shape of a menorah. So one of the things about the St. John's Bible is that was part of the concept from the beginning is really making it a cross-cultural Bible, so ecumenical in the broadest sense of the word rather than to suit one community or one client, which is closer to historic tradition. Um, it was really meant to be a way for, for the Catholic tradition to open its arms to every spiritual tradition as well as cultural traditions um, in every part of the world. And Donald's brilliant decision to use the relationship to the Old Testament in the New Testament is something that became a theme in the Bible throughout. Um, this is all Hebrew and what um, this is from a, a Hindu iconography. And in here, which I have a little slide of. So, so this is all this lovely gold that looks like flame and you know dancing energy coming off the top of it. And um, in here are strands of, of um, images of DNA. So the whole idea of humans transferring their DNA from one to another in, in a lineage was what he was working with here. And what a marvelous idea. So the menorah, this ancient uh, symbol, and uh, combined with, with the Hebrew lettering, and then this, this wonderful concept of something very, very contemporary and very much of our time. This is another page from the Bible. It's the total number of pages is 1156. So, um, and it measures four feet wide when it's open. Remember, it's on vellum, so it's uh, very much in the tradition of uh, medieval bookmaking and bookmaking in, in other cultures besides the Western culture. But um, you can see on this page, even though the margins are very small, there's still a, a little bit of a hint if you look farther in here. You think of where that optical center was in that diagram. And um, this is from the Song of Solomon. And even though the line lengths are very different, some of them are very short, some of them are very long um, on the different parts of the page because it's a poetic form, um, it still lives very happily inside that classical um, page design. And you can kind of see a pattern of them growing out from the center, that one and that one. And, and then this makes a lovely kind of lightweight border, even though it's outside of that. So um, within, within that framework, you can have a lot of fun. You really can play around a lot. But if there's some little trace of that pattern, it really holds a series of pages together in a, in a distinct way. And in some ways, you know, this is going back to some of Laurie's books. If you look at um, how this red sits on this page and is, you know, so intense and, and so big in this field of very different kinds of colors, and you look at Laurie's completely different book design, very loose, horizontal, you know, here she still alludes to these two columns of something. Is it writing? Um, and her field is in direct contrast on the color wheel to this blue center. So in some ways, it's farther down, certainly, than what we would see as part of the, the, uh, those proportions. But in some ways, this, to me, has a little similarity to, to Donald's design, in that you uh, work with something on the left-hand side of the page, very unexpected place for something prominent. And um, the balance is, is uh, still there in some ways. And returning to a, a couple more um, images from the St. John's Bible, this is a piece by Thomas Ingmeyer. And Thomas, in most of his illuminations, really chose to primarily use the lettering 
in different ways, and um, he's he's used this sacred geometry in in really marvelous ways as well. But he decided to really use the lettering to develop his design. So this area, this, this is from the I am sayings, um, I am the light, etc. And this is one of the most beautiful pieces of lettering, I think, um, in this book that really, really reminds us that we're in uh, the 21st century. And it, it's a wonderful juxtaposition, juxtaposition to these fine little gilded letters here. Um, and this says Yahweh. So it almost looks like torn paper or collage or something very um, untraditional as far as the letter forms were made. But um, So you look here and you see on this page, he has a framework that is clear and clearly defined for us by the way the text is designed on the page. And then he really broke the rules here because remember that, that um, optical center is way up here? So he's chosen to make this area really light and actually vacant and pulled the energy closer into the spine and gotten away by the connection between this and this with really creating something that really breaks the rules of those principles. And, and then I brought, I brought the rough sketch and the way that I work on the Bible um, that, that all the people that are doing illuminations work on. This, and the scribes also use these. So these are um, computer printouts of a typeface that they altered to replicate the spacing in the Bible. So the scribes use this as a way to guide them for what their spacing is like. And then when we get an assignment to work on a sketch, they send us this whole, uh, I'm only showing part of this, but they, show, they send the whole two-page spread, which replicates the whole piece of vellum that you'll be getting. And there's an open space, so I get it, obviously, with just the, the type pasted on there or the lettering pasted on there. And then I have to fulfill my assignment by filling in that space. So this was a piece in the wisdom books um, from Sirach, which uh, I wasn't familiar with. It describes wisdom as feminine. And it is one of the uh, ways that they lived up to their commitment to picture and portray and um, remind us all of the, the, the balance of women and men in society. So um, some biblical traditions don't really include things about women as much, but they made a commitment at St. John's to, to really have this Bible do some things that, that they felt were important in, in our society and, and in contemporary times. So um, wisdom was feminine and the various plant forms are all biblical plants and uh, fruits that were uh, described in different parts of the Bible. And all of the imagery I took from um, ancient rock art, both carving and sculptures that were um, part of the, the early agricultural goddess societies from 4500 BC. So I wanted to really go to the, the roots of when we um, used the feminine as an icon. And um, as a woman working on this project and, and one of the only illuminators that had worked on it all through the book, I, I really felt like that was something that I should get risky about if ever I was going to do something a little bit risky for this project. Um, maybe this would be it. And you'll see how this evolved um, as I worked on it. There's another sketch that I did that um, I didn't bring, but when I sent it to Donald for approval, he agreed that we didn't have to send it on to St. John's for approval, which is part of the normal process. And, and so this was the sketch we sent. Better press the right button here. This was the two-page spread of the finished vellum when I did it. And when my husband, um, usually the sketch is pretty accurate as far as you know the content of it. Um, St. John's wanted the left-hand side of the page to um, 
have something on it so that, now imagine those moons weren't there. And again, this is the weight, the weighty design is, is pretty much all down there. And remember, my optical center is right here. So I'm really working in the worst place to get vellum. So just imagine that those moons aren't there. And the whole design of the page would be really pulling your eye down off the page. But early, you know, when I got the assignment, they said, oh, no, we want you to do something up here. And you can just see how the energy, you know, pulls down into this chalice. But also, it pulls you up like that. So um, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it, it kind of counterbalances that effect. So this is palladium uh, gilding on vellum. It's a, it's a white metal that does not tarnish. And a little bit of combination with uh, 24 karat gold and palladium. There you can really get a glimpse of the gold. One of the common things that Thomas and Donald and I used and um, other people have used it occasionally in their illuminations that kind of links the various imagery is uh, we had rubber stamps made of sacred geometry and which are universal, um, lovely uh, patterns that break up the space. And uh, some of them are, are ancient. And um, the whole idea of using something like a stamp in the Bible was um, interesting to me. Donald came up with it and allowed us to all use it. And that very subtle aspect of, um, that repeats itself and is used in very different ways, I think really kind of pulls together in a very subconscious way, pulls together the um, different kinds of work in which people use it. And then I have a few slides of um, a very different book that um, gives you a feel for the, the primary work that I do. The Bible Project is um, kind of larger than life, I think, for everyone that's worked on it. And it's, it, it is consuming for some people that, that work on it more. It ends up being between 5 and 10% of the work that I do every year. And primarily, I uh, make a living making one-of-a-kind books. And you'll see that in this book, although it's not on vellum, it, it applies and will show you some of the principles that I've talked about in some of these um, earlier pieces. So back to this same, uh, you've seen this over and over again, but here it is. And I, it is the proportion that I designed for pages uh, that are full sheets of a printmaking paper, 22, um, uh, sorry, the, the finished book is 19 inches high and 12 and a half inches from spine to forehead. So it's 25 inches across and 19 inches high. And it's 10 Bob Dylan song lyrics. Um, it was commissioned by a, a collector in San Francisco. And he asked that we make two books. My husband is a design binder and book artist. And he's doing the binding as we speak. Well, maybe he's finished for the day now. but. Um, I handed it to him a few weeks ago after working on it for way longer than I thought I was going to. And um, the idea was that these 10 song lyrics would represent the, the facets in Bob Dylan's life's work. Well, if you've ever seen the book of Bob Dylan's song lyrics, it's about that thick. The guy was brilliant and prolific at the same time. And um, I thought I knew something about Bob Dylan until I really started to read these lyrics as poetry. And um, his art exists in the world and in people's minds and sometimes people's souls um, at, on its own. So the idea of trying to replicate something that happens in a musical um, recording was not what I was after. I really wanted to imagine. I, I did listen to the music over and over again, the particular songs that I was doing and, and other work that he did, but I really wanted to treat it as poetry. So that was my approach, to develop imagery that really was evocative of the poetic content of the piece. 
And so he chose these 10 songs to represent Dylan's work. And normally in a book, I would take a single idea and I would develop a series of images that evolve over the course of the book and tell that single story. I didn't understand at the time that I took the commission what it would take to do 10, to convey 10 distinct ideas and try to get them to work in one book. A very different way of working than I normally um, did and, and who knew? I mean, until I actually started working on it, I had no way of knowing what was happening. But, but this has um, a, a similarity to those er that early manuscript that I saw because this is transparent, uh, pa not translucent paper. It's a Japanese paper that I've treated so you can write on it really well um, and it's, it becomes more transparent when you varnish it. So um, it has, it lets me use this show through to take you through one stanza at a time of blowing in the wind. So that's where the page has been turned back. You see the second stanza, but you still can't see the third stanza. And the third stanza is on the back of the page. So now notice where I've put that. It's, it's short line lengths and I don't have enough of them to fill up that whole um, design that you saw, that grid, but the, the lines always end up on a grid that I've also created and they change from one uh, song to the next according to line lengths and how many lines will make up that song. This is Mr. Tambourine Man. Now look at this. This almost completely fills up that page design. And it's, it's a little more schizophrenic. You know, this has a psychedelic element to it, Tambourine Man does. And, you know, the magic swirling sh ship and going on the trip and all of that um, refers to, to psychedelic um, journeys. And um, this one, you notice that, that the line, the paragraphs or the, pa um, uh, what do you call that? Stanzas, thank you, <laughs> aren't all lined up on the left, they go in and out. So I'm playing around inside that basic structure and designing each of these pages so that um, it, it hopefully conveys the feeling of the song and I've used the advantage of that framework to, to uh, kind of build up a pattern. And this is little bits of um, this particular thing. I found a piece of um, ticker tape. And so much of Dylan's work is kind of accounting and holding us accountable for something that uh, has occurred in our society. Um, and the ticker tape to me represented a kind of keeping track and then showing, up to, showing it to us in a song. So when I finished using the ticker, ticker tape in a printmaking process, I gilded it and it became with, uh, you know, traditional gold leaf techniques and um, it became this gold ticker tape that was still, you know, it looked like a piece of thin, thin gold that was still flexible. And so this is a little piece of that ticker tape. So each design will have the tiniest, I only have one piece of this stuff, so I've got to spread it over two books and I decided that some aspect of that was going to appear in each design. So Mr. Tambourine Man, Blowing in the Wind, this is um, the tenderest piece in the book. It's a love song to his wife. Um, and it happens on a beach. He says, you know, it starts, I, uh, I laid on a dune, I looked at the sky, and, and then he goes on to describe how his wife and children are playing on the beach, and it's, a, it's a really, really beautiful. When he sings it, it doesn't have the tenderness that it does when you read it, and I was kind of thankful for that because um, <laughs> the, the words are just so stunning. And so this actually has a layer of thin paper on which I've done this white writing and inside it it has the thinnest paper in the whole book so it's a little harder to turn this page 
than other pages. And um, so this folio of paper is inside this folio of paper, which is on the background print. That's what the paper looks like that I've done the big writing on. And that's made up of phrases, um, calico nymph and please don't go and all of these things that um, are a big part of it. And you can see through it to the prints. I'm sorry, the color on this one is really off. It's much more subtle, especially in the yellow than, um, uh, and it, it looks quite different on the computer screen than it does projected like this. So I, I apologize, I'll have to get a better image of it. So this is what it looks like when you can read most of the song in this center page spread. But again, my diagram is providing me the framework for where this is. But in this case, I've pushed everything to the top on the left hand or verso page, and I've pushed everything to the bottom on the recto. This one is Hard Rains Are Gonna Fall. And um, boy, talk about an intense song. Uh, it's, it's approximately in the center of the book. It, it really is an extraordinary um, mirror of, of the worst of what might happen. And um, I saw it for its intensity as, as kind of the epitome of the message that Dylan was conveying at that time. And um, so it's actually two spreads. Everything else is done on a single spread with those translucent papers. But this is done with this page as an overlay. And there'll be a little tiny, one thing I haven't done is the, the, the title on this one will be quite small in red lettering, uh, hard rains are going to fall. And then you open this left hand page and you see that. And the letters up here um, are almost completely obliterated, but the top of each of the two pages for this song say hard rain. So there's, uh, for in a collagraph kind of technique, there's, um, or monotype technique, there are parts of letters that I've rearranged across the top of the page that say hard rain, hard rain. And then from that spills down um, the, the lettering. And the um, real colorful, the, most of the printing was done in black, so the real colorful part is a preliminary layer of acrylic paint. There are two religious songs that were selected for this, and um, this one talks about Dylan's uh, kind of path that brings him to a point of really considering what the future is going to be. And um, he, he clearly doesn't see the path that he's on as, as the best one, possibly. And so here he's kind of come up these steps into, um, you know, onto a threshold and, you know, could look back into something that's much darker uh, or possibly onward to a, to a doorway that um, is a very, represents a very different choice. So that's when the, the thin paper is covering both parts of the image. So I do the image as a, as a single sheet and then interleave it with the lettered pages. And you can see through that, you can even see the bits of gold that are here. So this is gold that's on this side of the page, but you can see through this paper, and you can see it much better in person, of course, but you can see the glint of the gold absolutely connected to the magic of early manuscripts. And um, gold is pretty seductive. So um, you can see it a, a little better here and here. And I imagined I'd use a lot more gold in this book, but when I got the images finished, I realized maybe I, I didn't need as much gold and it might not be as appropriate. It might be kind of arbitrary. But it certainly has its role in, in uh, hopefully well thought out places and, and um, in, in the right amount. So that's the end of, of my journey with you this evening. And um, I hope that you've seen some things that you didn't expect to see. You've confirmed some um, ideas that 
maybe you'd had in your mind, and that in some way books are, are places that you will um, keep close to you and be involved in, in whatever way um, works well for you. So um, thank you very much. I should keep this on, right? Um, yes. Okay. Because then I can walk around. Yeah. 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 That's okay. You're welcome. Shall I be the runner? I don't no, you, you just announced it. Oh, okay. Okay. Do we have any questions? We have a portable mic if you'd like it, and we can bring it to you. Anybody want to raise a question? There might be prizes involved. <laughs> I have a question. <laughs> I have a question. Where are you? Ah. <laughs> Good, thank you. Yes, go ahead. Um, I was... Just wondering if the design that you use on the double page is traditionally used also on a cover or a single page. So in, in book design, does that, does that placement transfer to the cover? Yes. Not usually to the cover, although because we see the cover as just half. You no, know, we, we never open the cover except design binders look at work like this, but um, you never really see the front and the back of the book the same way you see the open book. What is interesting is that if you put something absolutely in the center of a single panel of any kind, including a book, um, you, it, it will feel like it's slipping down. And if it has writing or typography on it, sometimes it actually sits better in that design if it's a little closer to the spine. It definitely works better if it's up from the bottom. Like a lot of matting is done in museums, you know, that the margins are seldom the same all the way around, if you've, if you've noticed the subtleties of that. Yes, I have. Thank you very much. Sure, sure. Thank you. That was easy. Yeah. How does this up your Oh, boy. Um, I got a marvelous opportunity to study full time. It was kind of my graduate school without the paperwork for it. <laughs> and I chose, uh, um, my options were to go to Europe and study with a man named Frederick Neugebauer or stay on this continent and go to San Francisco and study with Thomas Singmeier, one of the other people who became an illuminator. But this was in 1981. And after I finished studying, um, I decided to stay in the Bay Area because I got a job at Stanford University. And um, it was absolutely serendipitous. I just went to a talk. I was talking to someone, you know, at a reception over a glass of wine. And they were looking for an exhibition designer for their rare book collection. There's 17 libraries on the Stanford campus, and one of them is the rare book library. And I got lucky and got this crazy part-time job. My, you know, technically I was called a clerical person, so I was way low on the totem pole. However, my working space to organize these exhibitions was in the locked stack of the rare book room and in the basement. So I had a key, you know, thing to go to, um, a digital thing to get into it. And for anybody that spent any time adjacent or with rare books, it's really rare that anybody can cruise the stacks of a locked um, uh, library. And just being around books, and it was really magical because I didn't really know anything about this 
you know, world. I, I'm fascinated by the way work is shown in exhibition settings because I think it so dramatically affects the viewer that um, it's, it's just fascinating to me as a designer. So I was really interested in that part of it. I didn't really know about libraries and I, I didn't, you know, I wasn't educated in, at an Ivy League college, so going to Stanford as someone from the University of Wisconsin at Eau Claire, you know, <laughs> didn't put me very high in the pecking order. <laughs> but I did have this amazing opportunity to spend all my time with manuscripts and books and, you know, holding a Mozart manuscript and holding an 8th century manuscript and holding Matisse, Matisse's jazz, which now sells for about a quarter of a million dollars, you know. And I could, and, and you know, that isn't the point of it. it. It's a marvelous book, and that's why it's valued that way. But, you know, not very many people get the opportunity to walk into a room and pick out any book they want. Um, it, it really was a point of no return for me, and it was absolutely unplanned. I didn't even know that world existed, you know. Um, and there's a marvelous community of book people and lettering people in the Bay Area. There has been for a long time and letterpress and um, typographers, letter cutters, all kinds of people. And, but it was way too expensive for my husband and I, who is also a book artist, to live in Palo Alto, California. <laughs> so um, we moved to a, a, an extraordinary community of working book artists in Western Massachusetts. And a lot of people were our age. We were about 30 at the time. And, um, they had already been making books some, some since they were 17 years old, and they were people we'd kind of read about. And within about a 60-mile radius, there were about 50 full-time working book artists. So that was the community that we decided to move close to. And it was pretty extraordinary to be around people that had so much in common, everybody working on such different things. But there isn't another place in the world where there's that concentration of book artists. And we lived there for 15 years. So, um, you know, we went from individual immersions to this larger community. And, um, you know, eventually, because of the last em economic downturn, we're, we're really forced to leave that and, and get real jobs for a short period of time. But, um, yeah, so, you know, no logical, you know, meaningful reason or pathway. <laughs> Oh boy, that's an interesting one. <laughs> it drives me crazy when I, hard, I have a hard time finding them. But um, you know, based on this concept, it's a, it's a tricky thing to figure out. Um, I think putting them you know, on the lower edges and corners or the center fold actually make it harder for them to see. I mean, that's the farthest from the place that you, your eye naturally goes. So um, I've found that in contemporary book design, a lot of designers put them in a really small um, size, up much closer to that line that would be along the optical center of the book. Yeah, I, it's, it's kind of an odd place to put something rather arbitrary to the text, but it's so necessary that you need to find it. You know? <laughs> I think I've run the gamut of every possible varnish. Everything from clear, non-yellowing floor varnish to all the, all the varnishes and gels and different formulas of, of things that, that primarily that Golden offers. You know, you could buy it from another company, but um, one of the ones that I've discovered that I like a lot for, and it varies depending on the paper, and, and how much the proportion of water to um, varnish is or a medium of some kind. Because a medium is basically you're gonna seal up the fibers and that's what you're looking for. You're looking for something to seal the fibers so that they don't, um, the ink doesn't bleed when you put the pen on the page. So um, that's a very vague answer but it's because there are lots of answers and they really depend on the, the paper and what you need to be treating the paper for. So, um, yeah. What about the type of vellum? What, can you speak more about that? 
Um, yeah, the, the vellum, I don't have to worry too much about the vellum because it's, it's all supplied to me. <laughs> um, and there are, are very few vellum makers, of course, relative to what there, there used to be. Um, and Donald went on quite an exhaustive kind of round the world search for vellum. Went to Israel, came to upstate New York where there's a vellum maker, a very young, interesting guy making, started making vellum out of deer skin, you know, that people had hunted these animals and his, his family was in the tanning business and he said, wow, I, I think I could do something with this and started working with deer skin and, and uh, now makes vellum. But um, the, the places that make manuscript vellum treat it in a different way than binding vellum. Because a lot of these early manuscripts, if they did not have boards on them, which a lot of them didn't, they were um, bound with a style called limp vellum. And it was vellum that was basically wrapped and woven to itself to protect the book without any boards or glue or anything at all. And it's actually the best way to enclose vellum leaves, which expand and contract. Um, the, the manuscript vellum tends to be chosen because it's thinner, the skins are thinner, and they need to be able to turn, uh, especially if you're making a, a book. The, the, the smaller the book, no matter if it's paper or vellum, the, the more flexible the material has to be. So if you make a tiny book with stiff paper, you have to kind of pry the pages, you know, open. But, um, and, and so depending on the, the size of the book, you want to have very thin vellum. It's hard to get any vellum consistently that is of the quality that it was in early manuscripts, you know, in medieval manuscripts and, and a little bit later. Uh, probably because the demand has gone away. So, yeah. It's pretty pricey relative to paper. It, um, <laughs> um, some papers are pretty pricey also, but it's, it's approximately, well, it's somewhere between 16 and about $30 a square foot. So, you know, that's, that ends up to be a lot if you're doing 100 and, uh, 1,156 pages of that scale. <laughs> what? You know, so many figures have been thrown around and it's not really information that, you know, they, they sh uh, share. I, it's, not, it's not a secret, but, but I know it's, it's multiple millions that they've invested in it. And, and the interest in the publications has been so overwhelming um, that they probably will be able to really play out their goal, which was the first goal was, of course, to, to make this volu a set of volumes for the Abbey at St. John's um, to be able to share it as much as possible. But, but one of the bigger ideas that they had was to make a study center for manuscript books and it's that, that's an extension of their library and make it a place that scholars and practitioners from all over the world could kind of have uh, their paths cross and um, study and learn about historic methods and contemporary kind of applications of bookmaking. So because of the success in the publication, I think they're, they're closer to that than than they thought. Nobody, you know, nobody could imagine what it would take to accomplish anything like this because, you know, we just have no frame of reference. So um, everybody had a much more wild ride than they imagined. <laughs> things about the project to me was that they, you know, they really imagined and they designed it and decided on its scale based on this extraordinary piece of architecture on the St. John's campus. That, that's the, the Marcel Breuer Champ, Chapel, and which is this really amazing piece of architecture in the, you know, Minnesota landscape. And so they had 
that space in mind when they determine the scale of the book. And what interested me was that they intend to use it, that it will be used in services. And um, I don't think so. I don't think so. Yes? The various books are for sale. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it yeah, and there, there's a trade edition that is produced at two thirds the size, which is still a pretty substantially sized book. And um, as they, as we finish each volume, they've done the publication of that trade edition, um, so people can, you know, can actually have an interaction with it on a one-to-one -one basis. And then they're doing an edition that's full size printed on paper, and um, they've done extraordinary things to really make it not just a, a replication of the original Bible, but as Donald talks about it, to make a work of art that stands on its own. So it's certainly captured from the Bible, but you know, there's no way you can make a, a, a hot stamped piece of gold look exactly the same as the way someone would gild it, but boy, they are doing an extraordinary job. and. Um, uh, institutions and churches um, are purchasing one or more volumes to use in their services, which I think is really fantastic, you know, that something of that scale will, will be used in a, in a service. Yeah? Um, you can just Google St. John's Bible and you will quickly find a website and you can order online. It, it's an interesting website because it has one of those little um, features where you can take your cursor up to the corner of the page and you can turn the page and, and you can go back and forth and get it to turn back and forth and if you go, <laughs> it goes with the page. <laughs> you know, I'm easily amused. You know, I live on an island and uh, um, yeah. And, and you might even be able to buy it from Amazon or, I, I'm not quite sure. So, hello, by the way. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Here. It's the new revised standard version, which surprised some people because it was a Catholic, you know. Um, miniature tradition, uh, or is that identical to today's um, concepts of art? Um, no, there are people. One of the iconographers for the Bible is Aidan Hart, and he doesn't so much uh, work in a strictly m miniature tradition as far as scale, but he uses traditional Greek iconography. And there's a woman on the island that I moved to um, near Seattle who does botanical uh, illustration on vellum and it is absolutely to die for. It, I've, I've, the painting technique is just so extraordinary. So there's a whole, you know, kind of raft of people I think scattered around that are still doing these kinds of things. Um, yeah. One, One more. Mostly I choose my own text because I find it's easier to, um, to have a feeling for it that will produce a, a good piece of work. It's, you know, if someone gives me something, then I've got to figure out how to have feeling for it. <laughs> and, you know, I can do that. I, I've done that several times. But I think the process is a little faster and a little more elegant for me if I have the opportunity to choose a, a text. Occasionally someone sends me, you know, or asks for something that, that I've thought about for a long time. I just got a commission to do um, an Emily Dickinson, a book of Emily Dickinson poems, and the line lengths on Dylan are sometimes 69 characters long. And I could, you know, when I'm writing and writing and writing, I'm thinking, Emily Dickinson, Emily Dickinson. <laughs> I'm so happy to have that be the next thing I'm doing. 